Welcome to Booktopia TV. I'm John Purcell and I'm here with Tim Cope, author of On the Trail of Genghis Khan. Not only just uh, Tim Cope, but also Tim Cope's dog, Tigan. Welcome, Tim and Tigan. Thank you, John. How did, uh, how did you two guys meet? Well, uh, to start with, it was probably more, more, um, more a match in the, in, made in heaven from Tigan's point of view. Uh, I arrived in Kazakhstan, I'd just been uh, through the first kind of blizzards. Uh, this guy, I said, actually decided to ride with me for 10 days and he brought along this little tiny pup. And at that time he was this scrawny little thing, six months old. He was actually leaping off the snow onto, onto my shoulders just to get his paws out of the cold. It was the first winter of his life. And at the end of those days, this man, I said, and I think getting a bit restless, but um, he, this man, I said, said, you definitely need someone to keep you warm at night in the tent on your long journey to Hungary. You need someone to protect you from the wolves and most importantly to, to, you know, to keep you comfy. And that's when he, he handed me this little pup. And to start with, I had to say that I kind of resented him because I'd been given this liability, this little, little guy, but within a few days of, um, of departing, uh, we couldn't really, I couldn't live without him. And he grew into this, this as you can see, a, quite a large, and he may not—he may look a little bit uh, quiet at the moment, but he's actually a fantastic guard dog. And mind you, to start with, uh, I have to say that as he went to sleep at night in the tent, he was often thinking to himself, "Well, thank God that Tim's protecting me from the wolves." <laughs> but, but no, Tigan did probably 20, 30,000 kilometres. He grew up. He fathered children along the way. Became much more of a Genghis Khan than I. Uh, and he became really my companion, and still is, fortunately. So, um, uh, this Genghis Khan guy, he hasn't got a great reputation. Uh, why, did, why were you on his trail, and did he sort of owe you money or something? What, 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 what compelled you to chase this guy down? Well, the thing that really fascinated me about Genghis Khan and the Mongols generally, uh, the spark when I was riding a bike through Mongolia when I was 19, 20 years old, my mate and I set off to cross Russia, Siberia, to Beijing, and to start with, these bikes had been freedom machines, enabling us to kind of break away from a conventional path, pursue our love of adventure, but suddenly pushing our bikes through these miserable tracks in the desert, these incredible horsemen and horsemen and women would just come galloping from nowhere, they'd come over, say hello, and gallop off to wherever they wanted, and they, they seemed to have a sense of freedom uh, that I'd never really dreamed of, a world where there's no fences for thousands of miles, no fixed addresses, they are moving with the seasons, with their animals, with only a couple of inches of tent felt separating them from the elements. And the thing that really struck me when I, after, I went, after that journey I went home was that these were a people who went out and eventually created the largest land empire it's ever been. And whether you look at them as barbarians who you know, were bent on destruction and turned around from Europe one day and mysteriously went home, or you look at them as these ingenious administrators who set up an empire that would last 150 years uh, and facilitated the first real exchange of knowledge between East and West. And the amazing thing really is that they're nomads and these aren't rulers sitting in on their throne in a castle somewhere. Uh, and I, it's hard for us, particularly as uh, myself, I'm obviously of European descent, Australian, it's hard for me to associate a nomad with being the ruler of the greatest land empire that's ever been. And so I really wanted to know, you know who, who were the Mongols and what would it have been like for Genghis Khan and people of my own age who would have set off in their droves from Mongolia on these enormous journeys for thousands and thousands of miles into Europe. Yeah, I mean, when, I, when you talk about those, those places and the, the freedom and the openness of it, um, my question is is it is this one of those areas of the world where we haven't ruined, like we haven't destroyed, or, or mankind's impact hasn't been overly great? Is it, is, is it untouched? Is that some place on Earth where there isn't a shopping mall? Is that the? <laughs> well, certainly, the the Eurasian steppe as a whole, you know, which stretches from Mongolia to Hungary, still is essentially a you know, straight line, six to seven thousand kilometres of fence-free land, there's still no such thing really as private property. But there, there is kind of these, these two different worlds. Uh, in the east, like Mongolia, there's, we have like this last vestige, if you like, of 
what was once this this, this uh, grand and uh, widespread nomadic culture. And in Mongolia today, it's true that still somewhere between 30 and 50 percent of the population are nomadic, moving with the seasons. Uh, many Mongolians in the rural areas are still relying on their livestock, uh, packing their tents up and down. One of my most favourite encounters that's really burnt a, a deep memory in my mind was meeting this camel caravan coming, weaving its way out of the mountains in the west of Mongolia. And the lady who was dressed quite magnificently in the front in this great big purple dell, which is a long cloak, she got off her horse, she guided the, the lead camel down to its knees, went to one of the baskets and pulled back this sheepskin and there was this little baby cradled inside. And I'd kind of been, you know, white knuckled all day, hanging onto my horse for dear life. And here were these people putting more trust in their animals with their precious loved ones than we in our community might do with the most human beings at yeah. times. So in a sense, Mongolia was this, for me, this, this jewel that had somehow survived the Russian Empire, the Chinese Empire, the Industrial Era. Uh, but much of my journey, if not most of it, uh, was actually, in a sense, a quest to discover what was left of the nomad life since the Soviet Union had come into being and since, of course, collapsed. And my question really was, what effect did the Soviet era have on nomad life and what lay now uh, in the future for it? And Kazakhstan was really the crux of the journey. This is a country that's probably two-thirds the size of Australia, and like Australia, the interior is very sparsely populated. A um, hundred years ago, uh, about 98% of the people were nomadic. Nowadays, less than 1% are nomadic, and that's mostly because during Stalin's industrialisation uh, period of policies in the 1930s, about half the population, or as many as 2.2 million Kazakh nomads, actually starved to death. They were uprooted from their way of life, their animals were taken away from them, and those who survived had no choice but to really adapt and accept this new reality that had been forced on them, only for that reality, of course, to come crashing down in 1990. So I was entering a country that uh, didn't have that old in technology like there is in Mongolia to, to fall back on, neither did they have the Soviet system uh, that they'd become to rely on in the absence of that traditional life. And it was a place of chaos and uh, and, and kind of tra very visible trauma still, because there's lots of people there who've lived through the famine, World War II, the building of the Soviet Empire, the collapse, and of course the chaos that followed in the 1990s. So um, part of my journey was was uh, was quite depressing. Um, one example was a, a gold mining town called Akbukai. Now I'd come there with this romantic idea of get on a horse, I'd have a couple of pack horses, I'd set sail with a compass in one hand and have this never-ending rolling green grass, empty horizons, nomadic people. Uh, but in Akbukai uh, there were no nomads. In fact, I arrived there on Christmas Eve, it was probably about minus 30, minus 40. My horses were a little bit injured, one of them had an abscess. I'd basically gone there for self-rescue, and the only people who took me in were these two shadowy figures on the edge of town who uh, took me back to their mud hut. In the morning, they uh, turned out to be these two Russian alcoholics, Vidka and Grisha, who had actually lost their truck driving licences a couple of years earlier, delivering stuff to Akwakai. And I soon discovered that there was no hay, there was no grain, the gold mining industry had collapsed. Most people in the town were either what they call above ground thieves or below ground thieves. So to subsidise their, their, their livelihood, they'd be either rappelling up to 400 metres into disused mine shafts, digging out the gold, um, or they'd be paying bribes to the security of the, of the processing plants and getting gold in that way. Everyone had their own little backyard labs. Uh, these guys said, oh, don't worry, Tim, we're going to have a wonderful winter with us. Um, I went, they actually caught a couple of street pigeons for me that I boiled up for, for dinner. 
And in fact, that night, Krishna said, oh, you've got to meet my wife. She's as honest as, they, as a woman as you'll ever find. The time that she murdered our friend in the kitchen, she called the police herself. <laughs> and uh, you know, another five years and you'll get to meet her. But this was the beginning, in fact, of three and a half months of being stuck in this place. I tried to leave many times. My dog, Tigan, was actually stolen by unemployed mine workers who were actually eating stray dogs and pet dogs to survive. And although my problems um, were kind of began by defining my experience there, they paled into insignificance as it dawned on me the, the sheer kind of uh, turbulence that these people had lived through. And Akbakai, in a way, is a legacy of what in Soviet times they called monogorods, uh, which were cities that were built exclusively around one industry. And to bring people there, they broke up traditional kinship groups. So you had people from all over parts of the country uh, with no family back up, no family support. This island-like town, many hundreds of kilometres away from the nearest other town or city. And when 1990 came along and everything just collapsed, these people had nothing to fall back on. So there's, there's no um, uh, history of agriculture or, or stuff? stuff no. So there, and, everything was trucked in? And, and most of these, these places, like Akukai, they're places completely unfit for human life. Uh, as you said, no water, yeah. no feed for animals, everything was trucked in. The guy I stayed with for most of that time, Baidak, he had this underground store of thousands of uh, mineral, like you know, soft drink bottles full of water that he had trucked in for, for his own living. And it was just a very dysfunctional place where the only way to survive was, um, was to be involved in this contraband gold mining industry. So this is uh, obviously in circumstances like that people get desperate and this is dangerous. I mean what you're doing is is dangerous. If your family at home would be you know, considerably worried about what you're where you're up to and what you're doing. Um, did, when you set out, was there a, was there a goal for a book? Was there a purpose? Was it adventure? Was it to feel alive? Was it to see stuff? Um, I mean I, I think of Think of that and think of a young person setting out on such a such a journey, and I, I, I get anxious <laughs> just thinking about the idea. Um, it, it, what, what, what was it? What was it that? What was the, the, the number one reason for going? Adventure, life, um, event, um, discovery. What? Well, I think you spelled out all of the things, uh, but one of my friends pointed out from the very beginning. He said, "All you have to do is get on the horse, point it to the west, and." follow the sunsets. When the people start speaking French, it's mean, it means you've gone too far. <laughs> and I think that says a lot about this very simple idea of getting in the saddle and the horse being this ancient connection to the past, the, to the present, even to the future of these peoples. And the fact that the day I got on the horse, from then on the plans were behind me, they meant nothing. Uh, and a head lay 10,000 kilometres of places where people knew nothing about me. And that... Well, we know nothing about one of yeah. One of the, the things that I often think is the driving force of my, my journeys, but particularly that one, was just the very thought that, that I was going to arrive unexpected into people's lives. They would just judge me as I was in all states of disrepair. And as it turned out, you know, over cups of tea, uh, three days of feasting a week or whatever, there was this sense of camaraderie and friendship that, it, that, that was formed that defined the journey for me. And I couldn't have known that in full before, yeah. but it was the prospect that that might, or what might happen. And you kept and, you have diaries or something of, of all this stuff? And how did yeah, you keep I, all this? I, um, I kept diaries. I mean, I've, I've, I've loved writing since, since before I loved adventure, so I've, I've always used that as a way of you know, describing events around me, digesting it. Sometimes I feel like there's a backlog of stuff that's been going on and I have to get it out on paper before I can uh, be ready and open to new experiences. And that's what it's like for me day after day on the, on the trail. So I, yeah, I did want to write a book from the very beginning, but uh, as they say, you'd never begin to write a book if you knew what the book was going to be. And that's no different to a journey itself. Uh, I think. Essentially, the meaning of the journey changed from day to day, week to week, as things unfolded. And 
three quarters of the way through the trip, the journey had already become almost three years. I planned it to be 18 months. And at that point, I was in Ukraine. I'd just been through Crimea, through quite a lot of tension and conflict there. And I thought I was on the home run. And I had decided, I remember at that point, that the, that the, the whole character of this journey was all about these cultures and these people. It was, it was their lives viewed through my lens, but it didn't have much to do with me. And that was when I was riding along and got a message uh, from from Australia on my satellite phone to call home and discovered uh, that my father had actually been killed in a car accident. And I, I, the, the journey just kind of evaporated right there and then. I left the horses and, and Tiggin behind. I was back in Australia within a few days. And it was the toughest period of my life uh, and of my two brothers and sister. We'd never, we'd, we'd never have to cope with something like that. And I found myself realising that a lot of the things I learnt from the nomads had, had prepared me for dealing with this. And so my family and my life was also encompassed in this bigger story. So in a sense, uh, things, were hap things unfolded in a way that the, that the true meaning of the journey was constantly evolving and changing. But there was that, as I mentioned before, that, that simple idea of get on a horse, ride from the, the capital of the old Mongol Empire, Hadahorden, and end on the Danube River, the end of the, the nomad world. And in between, uh, my quest really was to understand who these nomads were and uh, Well, I mean, for, for a writer, um, this experience, you'd be, you wouldn't have to travel again, where well, you could just keep writing about these experiences, that you would, as, and if you were ever to move into fiction, if you were to move into uh, short stories, there'd be so many things that you could you could mine this this experience for, it's just endless, you'd, you'd think there'd be just so many, and if people were talking to you, you'd, you'd suddenly go, oh, uh, and such and such, and you know, even just in the conversations, in doing, in doing your um, events and the like, or even these sort of interviews, you, you start to remember things that you may have not even um, mentioned in your book or in uh, uh, to anybody yet, because there's just that's a big, big experience. It's a massive experience, and one book's not enough. I mean, we would need more books. <laughs> so, um, just last one last question. It's a, it's a, it's a silly question, but um, what was the most disgusting thing you had to eat uh, on your on your travels? Or what someone gave you and said, "Eat, eat." Yes, I mean to start with, I must admit that waking up uh, at eight o'clock in the morning for breakfast and to see this great big pile of steaming intestines filled with blood um, next to a charred camel's head and a communal knife and basically you hand the knife and say, right, dig in, oh. essentially. And as, as a guest, of course, you've got to eat the ears and the eyes and this. But I've got to say that over time, I actually craved that food. And I came to understand how it is that you can love your horse, but also eat it. In fact, that's a kind of a, if you can't understand that, if you can't understand how important it is to love your animal and kill it and eat it too, then you haven't understood what happens out there on the step, and this miracle that, that grass can be turned into fat, which in, t in, in terms of what's human life. But uh, by the end, the most disgusting thing I'd eaten was probably in the springtime in Russia. My, my clothes are falling apart at that time. And spring's a tough time on the step. There's lots of mud, and combined with that, the horses are molting. Yeah. And so I remember w walking along, my clothes were covered in mud, the horse hair was just sticking to all the mud, and of course the hair was kind of being taken by the wind off the horses and landing in my porridge. And I just remember gagging on my porridge all these long horse heads, which are pretty tough and coarse. You know, they, as they used to and still do use the horse head for, for the violins. In fact, the first instruments, got string instruments, were developed by nomads of Central Asia historians. Things. So anyway, that was probably the most disgusting thing. It's burnt <laughs> porridge, chunks of horse hair going down my throat. Thank you very much. That Thank was a, you. That was a that was a great um, uh, a great description. I mean, when when you when I have been brought up with a version of, of the nomads that I that I've uh, had, I had no idea. And um, if anyone wants to um, get hold of it and get a new perspective on uh, our life, our Western civilization, uh, what life is like in areas that most of us are never going to get to, um, get hold of Tim Cope's book. The Trail of Genghis Khan, which is available at booktopia.com.au right now.